All right, we are back. Arnold Palmer Invitational Week here on the Vince Eric's Pod, plus Puerto Rico Week, plus Live Hong Kong Week, plus we got the Deeper World Tour going. Four tournaments this week, Matt. How are you feeling after some boots on the ground there at the uh, Cognizant and now heading into a quadruple, the rare chance to hit four winners? So you don't get this opportunity very often. Four first round leaders, four outright winners. What could go wrong? I am very excited heading into this busy weeks. But uh, yeah, like we mentioned before, before we got on air, the the cog was was a grind. I was obviously out there for a few days and uh, it was a fun but long week. I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure there was mixed results. Uh, mixed feelings on the result because of the what 17 under one but it was just a long week yeah and we will talk about the cog here momentarily before getting to the quadruple week of golf ahead but did this last week worked out nicely uh really appreciate people supporting the pod so far so i gotta give the now that we're in the pod game i have to say this at the beginning of every pod like and subscribe uh on youtube spotify apple wherever you're listening uh that really helps us out last week first week i said that got a lot more likes on the pod played the algorithm we got in front of more people on youtube uh that's what it's all about so if you like the pod there might be somebody else out there who would like the pod who just doesn't know that it exists i really appreciate uh throwing a like on there uh if you like it too throw a comment in there we really appreciate that type of stuff um and so i'll just say that now now we'll jump into the good stuff since uh, i'm not big on on hyping ourselves up and i will say that uh, another week unfortunately where neither of us strike gold in the outright market austin eck wrote the winner of the cognizant classic in the palm beaches and we'll talk about austin here in a second but you had boots on the ground starting on uh tuesday how was it I know one of your first times i think really inside the ropes for like that much time before the tournament uh any highlights what was maybe the best thing you saw during the practice rounds the coolest thing you saw give us uh, some boots on the ground insights from before the event yeah that was honestly the first practice round i've been to in my life but i just i've always wanted to go and i'm obviously i was blessed to have the inside the ropes access for the practice rounds and just seeing the guys up close getting uh, to talk to them and just pick their brain like very minor but just talk, talk to them a little bit was really cool. Got some good insight, got some bad insight. Some of the fades went really good. Some of the plays went also good. I had a few top 20 hits, but it was just uh, overall a really cool experience, and I hope to be doing it more soon with you, hopefully for the majors, and uh, we can hopefully dial up a winner next time. Yes, sir. And I just uh, secured my boots on the ground for Tuesday, Wednesday next week at the players. Uh, we should chat that up to oh. after the pod, but uh, we'll have boots on the ground insight next week on the ground at TPC Sawgrass. So uh, get over to vincerics.com, get subscribed, uh, get in the discord. We'll be talking a lot of golf for the players. Uh, but here at the Cognizant Classic, I think the headlines on Thursday were what the fuck's going on out here? This is supposed to be a tough tournament. We're supposed to see guys struggling. We didn't see much of that. That's not a surprise necessarily to us. We talked about that on the pod. We saw some things, uh, you know, from the course ahead of time that said this is going to be a little bit easier Honda Classic than years before. We saw on Friday the wind kicked up a little bit, added some challenge, but uh, we get a tournament winner. I think this is kind of crazy. Austin Eckrote hits. 82% of the greens in regulation. That's the best in the field. That's why he wins this tournament by three shots. You were there. Uh, you, I guess you hadn't had boots on the ground. I think you'd been to previous uh, Hondas before, but like, what did you see anything that kind of stood out for maybe why the course was playing easier? What was it that, uh, you know, from being there that might have stood out for why we got such a, an easy event? Yeah, I'd say two things. The rough was significantly down. You could tell as a, just a bystander that it was down. And also the bear trap played downwind three out of four days. Uh, I believe that maybe three, even three and a half days. So I think it was the least amount of balls in the water uh, on those three holes in tournament history or, or something like, like that. So yeah, those two things were, you could really tell the rough was down just because I've been there the last three years. It's, it's thick rough out there, but around the, around the fairways, it was just, you can easily play out of it and control your ball. And uh, so far, I will say I've done a, a reasonable amount of research so far into Bay Hill. Things seem like Bay Hill should be normally what we expect at Bay Hill. Uh, we still need to get some some quotes from players here, a little bit more of what's going on uh, in these practice rounds. But signs are that we should hopefully see Bay Hill as we tend to see. Now, with that being said, part of the reason also that I think we had an, not the same conditions at PJ National was this. Uh, what is it? El Nino, La Nina, which one ever is happening down El there. El Nino. Yep. El Nino happened down there in Florida. So that will still have some effect on, on Bay Hill. And we'll talk about that in a second. But the winner, Austin Ekro. We talked about some of the boxes that we wanted guys to check last week. We wanted guys who had played well at Sony. We wanted guys who had played this tournament before. We wanted guys who could kind of spike across the board. And 
I wrote up Austin Eckert last week as one of the first guys off the card. Uh, you wrote up Austin Eckert, but headed the tournament as somebody who kind of checked a lot of the boxes. Neither of us bet him. Same problem that we're all having this year. We bet some losers near the top of the board when we could have just added five, six more guys down the board. Austin Eckert's on the card for sure if we do that. But he's a player who's been knocking on the door a reasonable amount. Obviously played good at the U.S. Open last year, type of player who should play good in the conditions that we see at the Cognizant. He breaks through. He's fourth in the field off the tee, fifth on approach. He leads the field in GIR is fourth in driving accuracy just an all-around excellent performance from him he'd never won anything before but uh a breakthrough victory for Eckrod and, and well deserved uh, by basically every measure yeah definitely and i wrote up last week how he found the best iron week of his career in mexico literally of his career i know it's a short career but it's of his career and he immediately wins similar to what we saw like Wyndham uh, at the amex had a great spike iron week and he won immediately so that doesn't happen that often usually guys play okay foreshadow something for a little bit and then a win will come maybe but to, to have it immediately following the next week after a good result is uh fairly uncommon and that's happened already twice this season and i will say i didn't see much of the action this morning i kind of assumed ekra was gonna hold on to it after okay. seeing like how he played uh in the evening looks like i got a little bit closer but then he, he finished relatively strong and He's a player that I think he's been pretty hyped up. He's obviously on those Oklahoma State teams uh, with uh, Hovland and Matt Wolf. And uh, what's our was our boy from the DP Rasmus uh, Nearguard? Nearguard Peter. Yeah, was, was he on those? And squad? Chris Ventura. Okay, and Chris Ventura was playing good. He was playing good last week at uh, that tournament in Argentina. I think so. Big week for Oklahoma State golf. Yeah. Uh, he's going to be certainly one to watch going forward. I'll be it'd be interested to see how he plays this week at API. He uh, he had that stretch last year for about two months where he's playing great, played good at Byron, played good at the U.S. Open. Yeah. Uh, and then he completely fell off a cliff and sucked at golf for pretty much the rest of the year, was terrible. That's why I think he was 150 to 1 uh, going off in this tournament. Another week on go to golftop and serix.com to see the odds and, and things like that. Another week where the winner is a guy who drifts during the week, not a popular pick by any stretch of the imagination. And I think it's important to consider this as we get ready to talk about Bay Hill as well. Just another week where... We're just seeing, as you said, he was heating up at the irons, doing little things like there just aren't players at the top of the board right now who are playing so consistently, so getting to the top of the leaderboard on a weekly basis that these guys who are hot and playing well, why shouldn't we just keep riding these guys down the board who, who check a lot of the boxes and give ourselves more options? Because we just sat here last week and talked about the same thing with Nap saying we were looking for guys who played good at Farmers. Boom, Nap played good at Farmers. He won the tournament. We were looking for guys who played good at Sony. Eckert played good at Sony. He had a, struggled once he hit the lead, but he was up there for a good chunk of the tournament. I think simple, give yourself more options. It's just another week where that seems to be the right thing to do. I mean, yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more on that, but I just feel like the, the when we do that, we start a card <laughs> at 50 to one, Scotty wins, Roy wins, something stupid like that. And like I we we've been saying it, but this is the course that T to green, ball striking, stuff like that, 10 under and or single digits wins. So I don't know if what I want to say. Like, do I want to throw their card at 50 or do you want to go to the top again? I'm probably going to find myself going to the top again because that's what I've been doing. And I don't want to break off my strategy that's worked the last few seasons of golf betting, but it's been an absurd start to the year. And I th we'll talk through the board obviously soon, but I don't know where what I want to do uh, going into this week. We'll get there in a second. Do you want to go down the board a little bit of cognizant? Because I think there's some guys we had takes on during the week, and it's always good to revisit yeah. your takes and and then have them in your mind as you get ready to talk about the next week. EVR, I bet him in Mexico. I said to you guys in the chat before Cogs and I said I would be most mad if EVR wins this tournament because I did like him. And, and obviously, he's playing great golf. He's been so consistent this year. He comes in. He's, he's kind of middle of the the pack for most of the event comes out absolutely guns blazing in the final round. He may win the tournament. If that rain delay doesn't hit, he got to 14 under, uh, which ends up being second place. I think he might've been able to get to a 15, a 16, maybe even 17. Uh, if he doesn't get thrown off by the rain delay, he, he leads the field in putting after making absolutely nothing in Mexico. He, to me, He's an elite player. Like he has elite ball striking ability. He spikes his ebbs and flows with the putter, but EVR is a guy that in the, you know, 80 to one range, if he gets into the hundred to one plus range in these bigger events, there's no reason that he can't mix. We've seen him mix before down the stretch in playoff events. He had those struggles with the injury a couple years ago, but uh, I just wanted to highlight EVR because I think we need to keep our eyes on him on almost a weekly basis uh, with how he's playing. Yeah, that was a crazy uh, start to the literally right when I got to the tournament yesterday, uh, EVR was going crazy. I think it was eight under through 11 or something like that. And we were about, we were about to go follow him and the horn blew. So 
I did not see a single golf shot yesterday. We got there and immediately had to get, get a rain delay. So uh, do you think you mushed the rain delay? Because you tweeted maybe five minutes before the rain delay that this was going to be a great final round. And then boom, everything was fucked after that. So did is that a, you may have mushed. I said, get ready for the, get ready for the rain and win. It's, it's coming. It's about to blow. Cause it was just getting, it was getting chilly. The, I heard the trees rustling immediately as I tweeted that rain delay and we were fucked. So maybe I'll take that one. That was my fault for the weather. Uh, maybe I control the weather with live now. So that was a thing that thing to look forward to. <laughs> and uh, Minwoo flowchart, the flowchart works. The flowchart isn't, the flowchart doesn't say he can't play well. He can't finish second right. place. He can't mix the flowchart says if it's not a links course, he cannot win the tournament. He did not win the tournament. Uh, and the reason for that was too many wayward iron shots. He hit one into the water the on stretch. the part three. And that's why the flowchart matters. Cause if this was a links course, those don't punish him. Not as many bogeys. He wins the tournament. So I just want to say the flowchart still working. No need to worry about the flowchart. Everything is fine. There, cage Lee. I thought he was destined to be on the corn Ferry tour soon enough. He might be back t4 finish for cage lee but the guy when you talked about cam young uh i said on the pod last week he's gonna play well he's a lock for high finish he's also a lock for never truly being in the mix and uh of all the takes last week that might have been my best one you had him he did what he always does some if you would if i had told you before the tournament that uh cam young was gonna gain almost five shots with his short game putting plus around the green uh you probably would have assumed that one was cash yeah, I'd, I'd be pretty confident in that. And uh, he missed so many putts on the edge. Like I was following, and I'm sure this happens every single week in a golf tournament. We don't see every single shot, but I was following Cam Young for a majority of the week. This dude lipped out four putts on Saturday. And I was just like, are you fucking kidding me? And he was just like, so he so doesn't even care. He just like goes about it, taps it in, moves on to the next hole. And not that that happens every single week, like I said, but. He had the game to win last week. He truthfully did. But as soon as he really got into like, like, okay, I need a birdie now, he fucked up. Like on yesterday on 10 or two days ago on 10, had a three-footer for bird, missed it. In the fairway on 18, what 200 yards to, the, to get to the front of the green, in the water. So those are three strokes he could have had. I'm not saying he would have won if he did those things well, but it's just Cam Young does the same thing every time. He gets himself in somewhat of consideration and – blows up fucks up and yeah he's cam young what am i gonna say you probably didn't hear it as much because you had boots on the ground i watched a reasonable amount of the tournament i was at a wedding this weekend so that was cutting into my uh, golf viewership just a little bit but every single time they show cam young on the broadcast legitimately every single time that he is putting the announcers go oh man if this guy's putter could heat up he would win so much on the like it's they probably said it 25 times if they said it if i had a dollar for every time they said that i'd be rich because it's like every time and it's he actually putted great. Like he, he can putt well. It's just, yeah, it's if the he putt, yeah. If he putted more consistently, then yes, he would be right near the top more often. But he's not missing anything from his game that is stopping him from winning these tournaments. It is no, one hundred yeah. percent mental, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, and I uh, quick nugget. I was uh, uh, with uh, someone from the PGA Tour last week, and they were talking about how Paul Tosuri was reaming Cam Young on the range, like not like reaming him face to face just like talking shit behind his back <laughs> so i just thought it was very like about his mental game yeah and i was like that's very like i agree with you but like that's not something you just say to like in the, in the public but i thought it was a quick nugget to go along with that that is interesting and i and he is such an interesting player to watch just because like he looks like he hates golf to some degree like when he's out there it's just yeah. like he looks pissed off all the time and i could get like it's probably a combination of he wants to win so bad. Like, obviously, he and he knows he's capable. He just looks so angry. Out, it, he actually reminds me. I always thought Neiman d looked that way a lot on the golf course, too. Like, when Neiman was on the PGA Tour, and now he's on live, and Neiman looks a lot more chill uh, out there. Right. Obviously, he's playing great now. Um, but I always thought Neiman looked like he hated golf. Now, I think Neiman likes golf again. Cam Young maybe gets a win. He starts... He's the type of guy who I think he gets the win and he's going to reel and off some good results. Yep. But I can't say when that's going to happen. And I can continue to come on here and say a terrible bet in the 20s in those type of events because he's just as likely to win, I think, at 50 to 1. In an event. I don't know what his odds are this week. I haven't looked. We'll get to it in a second. But like, he's just likely to win a big event at longer odds than he is an easy event or a, a lesser field event at lower odds. I, I think that's pretty cool. that was such a non-competitive t4 too and it was like you really hit the nail on the head too because he played great golf great golf and just never had a chance to win never not one uh shane lowry he's not a loser because he's an open champion uh he's won the bmw pga which is the big event on the dp but he is a loser in the sense that on the pga tour when he gets anywhere near the lead 
terrible things happen. Uh, I was on him when he chipped into the water at RBC. He's obviously great on these positional Bermuda tracks. That's when you got to play him. He's very comfortable here at Honda. But that final round uh, was he lost strokes in every T to green category after dominating T to green pretty much the whole week. Like there's something that's, I don't know what to say, but he's, I can't say he's a loser. I can't go down that path of a take because anyone with a major, you're good with me forever, but it was just another Shane Lowry in the mix performance. Yeah. And I was kind of uh, upset that I didn't give Shane Lowry a further look. Cause I had good write-ups and good feelings about him previously going into the week. And I was like, nah, I just didn't really dive deep into him. And he was right there over the week. And I was like, damn, I really miss Shane Larry. I had a decent number too. And happily that one didn't pay off because I would have been pissed. But I think the note to take away from that and going back to kind of just assessing the PGA Tour this season this year is with it being as wide open it is and with all these random guys playing well, like a guy with great course history at longer odds like Shane Lowry was last week, it's kind of throw away the stats. Don't worry about it too much. Like that course history carries as much weight right now as anything else because like nobody is performing at a, a consistent level. A guy who was performing at a consistent level, Jake Knapp, he got on another heater in the final round. Uh, the dude's good at golf. Uh, he gains of four strokes off the tee, almost four strokes on approach, putted well again. The short game, the around the green game is, is definitely the biggest weakness uh, that he has. But when he hits every green, you don't need to worry about chipping. He impressed me. I think we didn't expect much from him coming off the win. He uh, ranked eighth in the field in fairway proximity. We'll get to, obviously, Bay Hill in a second, but this dude is, one, is playing the most consistent golf uh, on the PGA Tour over the last month and a half. Yeah, I did personally lose a lot of money fading him in matchups just because I was being dumb and I'm waiting for him to explode, which he did on Saturday, but that was it. And I, it's just so consistent, even though it looks like it could blow up at any time. Like we talked about the tempo and the and the stuff like that under pressure. But it's just he reeled down at a course that didn't really make sense for him and hit fairways and hit greens. And ha- hat tip, Jake Knapp, very impressive performance. You are good at golf. You have guts too because you – played well on Sunday when you were out of it and got yourself into another T5 finish. So props to Jake Knapp. And uh, he was in the first couple rounds. He was with Rory too. And he talked about like being excited, a little nervous about that and and played good in those, in those scenarios. So yeah, Jake Knapp one to watch. It'll be interesting to see him now. First time kind of in one of these big events uh, with the pressure on, on the uh, quick touch on live. I didn't see a single shot of live, but Jocko Neiman does it again. The man is playing unbelievable golf. He is playing as good as anybody in the world. Uh, he is going to be exciting to watch as we get to the masters. I don't know. Did you catch any live uh, up bright and early this week? No, I did not. It was uh, like on the 3 a.m. And it was just like yeah. long weeks at the Honda. I was not staying up for that. And uh, yeah, uh, props to Neiman. I shouted Rom at six to one. Uh, obviously he fell short T5 after leading in the first round. I think he shot one under on day two, which will do you nothing on live. So um, yeah, uh, props to Neiman. He's playing great golf. I'm not sure who should finish runner up again, uh, but he, it might have been Louie, but no one was close. Yeah. I mean, he had the, again, I didn't watch it, but it looked like he had the lead pretty comfortably uh, on Sunday there. The uh, runner up was Louie tied with uh uh, a fellow Stinger GC golfer, Charles Schwartzel, uh, finished in a tie for second there, fourth place, Deshambo in fifth rom. I talked about Neiman on the pod last week. He was going to be my pick. Uh, and then I talked myself out of it. I thought it was too good to be true. I thought that, you know, he got the Masters in, but he wasn't going to care anymore. The only thing I'm going to say about Liv, and I guess we serve as Liv defenders sometimes, even though by no means do I think Liv is, is great. I just kind of try to look at things from the most, you know, neutral okay. point of view. Neiman wins. He comes on there and he says like, oh, he has like a chip on his shoulder. You know, he says something about how like, how could I be the favorite when I'm not, you know, top whatever in the world. And everybody gets ready to fire off their takes about like how, you know, whatever that was. It's like, yeah, he's going to have a chip on his shoulder. Every guy on live thinks they deserve world ranking points and thinks they're being, you know, misconstrued in the rankings. They're going to say it every single time they get interviewed. and They're going to keep saying it like. Why do we have to be in this take again where everybody's goal is like, ooh, can I get the you know the best take against Liv and all of this stuff? It's just like that's not helping the situation by any stretch of right. the imagination. And if we're ever gonna get things to come together, like this instant effort by kind of you know the no laying ups of the world who I like and things like that to just like try to create a scene over things the Liv guys are saying, like, yeah, they're mad. They think they deserve OWGR points, they're playing great golf, like it's gonna come up every time. I would just ask the the take again. Just can we just relax? Basically, it's like it's so frustrating. 
Yeah, it's every single week. Someone on Live says something, maybe out of pocket, maybe outlandish, but like it's what they're gonna say. Where we've been in, in down this road three years now, so uh, yeah, the live the live guys are still not getting what they want, and who knows what will happen in the past. But I do think a merger or uh, something along those lines is coming. I'm very soon. I think the, we're gonna see these guys by 2025 at the latest. Truthfully. I like the sounds of that. I would love that. But yeah, didn't have much eyes on Live. We got Live Hong Kong. We can talk about that uh, at the end of the show here. We got a new course over there that I don't believe they have played before. Uh, and that guy who's always on the broadcast for Live is very excited about it. Right. So Neiman's playing great. Um, we'll see kind of what his numbers look like. I know people are piling into his master's futures. Obviously, uh, the course makes sense for him. I think he could play well there. I'm not... Uh, going to be running and jumping in numbers by any stretch of the imagination right now especially this year on tour and especially as I, I tweeted out and we've seen it now since we've launched the tracker of movement on golf top and serix.com the guys who are drifting the guys who are not popular those are the plays that you want to be making this year there's no need to be rushing and doing first clicks and being like oh you know yeah clv is a real thing and if your guy goes from 80 to 1 to 40 to 1 like good job you you know saw where the market was going meaningless and the effect effectively like at how this guy's going to play in the golf, tournament yeah. it's not in golf like in other sports it, over over longer periods but like you could have clv every week for the next 10 years in golf and literally not hit one winner not like, one it, it's just yeah. that's just the way that it goes it's different if you're like betting spreads or something like that the clv yeah. is kind of meaningless in golf unless you're unless you're in the card construction world and you're going to get another name but you have to hit that name then <laughs> yeah exactly so i'm uh fully on board with the take your time do your research, find the guys you want to bet. Uh, if you, the odds of you missing a guy on your card, just because his odds moved, like you could still just bet him and bet other guys, unless you're like deciding on somebody who went from 12 to one to like eight to one, which almost never happens. So uh, yeah. I'm in the patience book. And that leads us to Bay Hill, Arnold Palmer Invitational. Always one of the tougher tracks on the PGA Tour. I think it should be, based on everything I'm seeing, tough again this year. It might be a tad easier just because, again, of the conditions. I don't think the rough will be quite as thick and lush as it is. I think it'll be just as deep, uh, three and a half, four inches, as it tends to be. But uh, some of the grass growing, you know, that's been part of the issue down there in Florida with the El Nino. Obviously, of course, where Tita Green play really matters. But with that being said, just to kind of, try to find an angle you know that maybe is not the the consensus angle for the week this is a tournament where both scotty scheffler and kirk katiyama combined to gain zero strokes off of the tee over the last two years and they won the tournament that to me is not a course that is one of the top tee to green courses on the pga tour this isn't memorial this isn't one of those courses where you have to you know gain four shots or whatever it is off the tee that shifts where you need to gain two putting, two around the green, some short game type of stuff. We saw Spieth last year pretty much only gain chipping and putting and almost win the tournament. Right. I think there's more ways to win at Bay Hill than just be a beast uh, T degree. Yeah, and I think that gets swayed with Rory's success at uh, at Bay Hill. Everyone thinks you need to be a bomber. You need to just drive it a million a million yards. So, but I agree with what you're saying. Last, year, did you have Spieth too last year? Painful. I did. Yeah, we both did. That was a. a in-person sweat that one hurt a lot so um there's definitely multiple ways to do it around bay hill and like you said i was actually not aware that scotty and kurt both did not stripe it off the tee and still won so interesting to look at and like you get a place where kurt kitayama last year coming into the tournament was like highly inaccurate off the tee like way down the rank probably 150 right. on the pga tour in driving accuracy he ends up finishing first in the field in driving accuracy because he just clubbed down and hit three woods and he's in just put the ball in play off the tee, which just shows that like a guy who has distance here can switch clubs and hit three woods and right. hit irons off the tee on a lot of Hulk, try to get the ball in play. So I think the off the tee story now, yes, you can gain a lot off the tee here as Rory did as last year, a guy like Cantley did when he was driving an amazing guys who are driving an amazing long and straight coming into the tournament are going to gain a bunch off the tee obviously. And that's a way to bump you up into the top 10 purely off of your driving. Or if you're a great ball striker, you can get into the top 10. You can be in the mix purely on your ball striking, but you got to make putts here. You're going to miss greens. You're going to have to scramble. I don't care how good you are. Uh, I mean, Kurt led the field in or second in GIR percentage last year, uh, but only hit 71% of the greens. That's still, you know, three out of 10 times you're scrambling max led the field in gir percentage and finished t14 because he lost strokes putting and around the greens like you got to do other stuff at bay hill 
I'm not right. buying. I'm not going to take part in the just go sort, you know, by T degree and don't worry about putting. You got to be able to do it all here. And the other piece is Bermuda results. Like you go back through the winners here. These are guys who have played well on Bermuda. They've putted well on Bermuda. Bermuda might be their best surface. Like that piece of the puzzle too is key, especially again, we got another week where we were just on the West coast. We saw these tournaments on uh, POA. I think uh, waste is a good comp to kind of look at from something earlier in the season. Obviously Scotty won there, came here one Kurt played good there last year before coming here. Uh, the Bermuda piece, obviously being uh, a key piece of the puzzle this week as well. Yeah, I totally agree with everything you already said. I think uh got to be able to chip and putt really well because there's going to be trouble on those second shots. Not really too much off the tee. There's not the most trouble, but you got to be able to keep your ball uh, on and around the green because you're not going to do it for 72 holes. You're going to have to be able to chip and putt with these firm greens. And what will be interesting to see is the distance piece. There's a clear distance bias here. All the stats are going to back up the fact that the longer you hit it here you know, on average, the better you're going to do. Now, part of that is because the fairways can get really hard to hit. They just get super firm. And then it doesn't like you're going to run the ball right. through into the rough, no you matter can't what possibly stop it. Yeah, exactly. And when you have that, then the distance really helps you because the further you are down the, the hole in the rough, the more likely you are to be able to get the ball onto the green or second shot. If the course is a little softer this year and there's going to be some rain in the forecast, it looks like, uh, and this will be something to monitor. And again, we'll talk about this on the website, on discord. We'll be keeping track on is if it's a little more wet, then you may be able to hold more fairways. And then the distance actually may decrease in value a little bit, because if you're able to hold the fairways, then more players can play from the fairway. Then it's not like everybody's going in the rough. You need to be as far down there as you possibly can. So I will right. definitely be kind of listening to player interviews and looking at that stuff um, as well this week to see if distance is going to matter either way, but kind of how much I want to weight that in my thinking about players. I agree. I agree. And when we talk about distance, when we talk about guys who hit the ball far, uh, obviously at the top of the board this week are going to be two guys that kind of fit that ball striking mold. Scotty Scheffler, Rory McIlroy. We do this every single week that they play in the tournaments. We talked about this, uh, I believe, at Pebble. We talked about this at Riv. And we said Scotty Scheffler versus Rory McIlroy. And we broke it down, and, and neither of them have really come close to winning uh, either of those events. Scotty obviously putted absolutely miserably at... Uh, uh, Genesis, he comes into this tournament. I think it's important to note that his L50 strokes game putting per round uh, coming into this tournament two years ago when he won was plus 0.2 per round. He was a positive putter L50. He's minus 0.3 right now. Uh, that's a concern for me for Scotty. And then Rory, no top 20s yet so far on the PGA Tour. This season, obviously, won in Dubai. This is a place he's played well before, but uh, let's do it again. Scotty versus Rory. Scotty this week, much lower in the odds. He's 7-1. to one. You can get 10-1-ish, uh, to one -ish, uh, maybe a little bit above, depending on book on Rory. So it wouldn't be a true 50-50 matchup, but let's just say that it was. Uh, how are you feeling about it this week? Yeah, I think if the conditions are going to be a little bit softer, if more birdies are going to be needed to be made, I'd probably weigh Rory higher, especially with the course history. I think he's done so well here because of apex height into greens. I know it sounds crazy, but he's he hits such high balls, and the greens are so firm usually. They're just more ball stop than, than they don't. So I think he and he loves it around here. Obviously, he's one one has three other top five finishes. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna go with Rory in that matchup. Rory's been driving the ball amazing, and, it, and like yeah, not just Rory, like he always drives the ball amazing. That's a shoe in with Rory, but like some of the best driving of his career. He's got a new driver in the bag this year. He uh, he doesn't usually give you three straight events of like really good accuracy off of the tee. And uh, he has done that. And it's led to him gaining uh, almost six strokes over six strokes off the tee in his last two events. He's going to gain four or five, six strokes off the tee this week. That's going to boost up his baseline really high. Now, Scotty probably push it gets close to those numbers, but Rory's driving it better than Scotty is right now. My problem with, with Rory is the rest of the stat line. Not good. Not good. Right. Some of the worst iron play stretch in a while. And they ran the green and the putting is not good. Like he'll get back on Bermuda. I think he'll putt better. Uh, but yeah, top 10 lock of the century type of thing. I like, it'd be surprising if he's not top 10. I just on a week again, as we talk about not wanting to go towards the top of the board, it's tough for me to, to get excited about Rory. like, I need to, we've talked about this before. If we're going top of the board, if we're going single bullet, if we're I taking up a huge, we need to say with confidence he's gaining across the board he's going to give you putting he's going to give you that obviously scotty you can't feel any confidence with the putting sure you can say he putted well here before and i'm sure there's going to be takes out there this week that oh this is the week you know that scotty fixes his putter but 
he's lost on the greens in two of three starts here. The year that he won, he came in putting really well. Like, I don't know about you, but I can't say that I see any great reason why Scotty fixes his putting this week. Yeah, it's tough because he, I mean, I want to bet him. I want to bet him. I want a single B. I'm not scared of single B, but you can't trust the putter. It's so bad. But I want to look at what Rory did. I know the iron ha- iron play has been bad of late, but he gained two strokes on uh, on approach at the Honda, and he rinsed the ball and he rushed a few. He rushed to finish yeah, that round. He, was, he was running in, yeah. He looked a lot better over the ball with approach, and I thought that going into the week, he had that week off. He's back in Florida. He should hit his irons better. So I do feel comfortable confident about Rory hitting his irons better, especially at a course that he's played so well out so i do like rory this week truthfully yeah that's fair and i'll I'll join you on the rory over scotty in the matchup obviously i think both are are very strong likelihood to be in the top 10 i don't think i'll be betting either of them mainly because of the putter like i said i i think you still need to gain close to four with the putter you probably need to gain two let's just say you need to gain six to seven putting plus around the greens this week no matter how good of a ball strike you are right it's been a while since Rory's done that. Uh, you got to go back to BMW. But uh, yeah, Rory, obviously a place that he loves. And we say it every week. If you like Rory, been him first round leader. I think he's been first round leader here uh, a couple of times. I can picture him being like five, six, seven under uh, in the first round of this event. Maybe two years ago. Yeah, they're in Wells Fargo. I think they did it the same year. So that could be on the sea. That could be on the sea. And then we get after those two, we get into the. The range of despair is what I'm going to call this range because only bad things happen when you bet these golfers lately. And honestly, most of the time, like every now and then they they pop up and win. It's Victor Hovland. You can get a 16 to one on Victor. Uh, You can get a 16 to one on Xander. Can't lay. We'll bucket in this group. He's 18 to one. And then it kind of drops off. So we'll talk about the rest of. Oh, and uh, Ludwig. Ludwig's at 20. So we're going to bucket Ludwig, uh, Hovland, Xander, and Pat. And we're going to do the classic least likely most likely of these four xander pat lud and victor hovland give it to me um yeah i would say most likely i'm gonna go i'll give you my reason one victor two ludwig three xander four pat okay this this is this is ugly but victor obviously not playing the best golf uh the short game woes are back Great course history, course sets up well for him. The the factor is he has dog. He has that. He's in it. He's going to go get it. Ludwig, he's doing everything right. He's a young stud. T to green beast. Got the distance. Got the short game. But he hasn't really seen this place. And then Xander and Pat, check all the boxes. Zero guts. How could you trust them ever? At least in 2024, March. I mean, yeah, even back to, I mean, they didn't win, neither of them won last year either. Uh, I will say, I'll, a reminder, because I said this after Riv, I said, when the next tournament comes around, which is this tournament, we're going to look at the stats on Xander and, and Pat, and we're going to go, oh my God, this is unbelievable. These guys are unbelievable golfers, and they are. But I also said, just remember what happened at the Genesis. So everybody listening, if you're thinking about betting these guys, sure, we can. Again, they they should win. They should win the tournament. Uh, you cannot trust them at all. Xander, if I had to go with the order, I'm actually going to go. And you know how I feel about Lud. I've actually been Lud has been growing. I like Lud as a person. I hated the hype about him, but now that he's struggled, not struggled, but he he hasn't really popped off yet this year. He obviously played good at Pebble. He might have won that tournament. The hype's down a little bit, so I'm cool again with Ludwig. He to me actually is going to be my choice as most likely to win. He played here as an amateur last year and finished T24 and gained uh, 5.2 putting. And that was before he had the ball striking or he, he he obviously had the ball striking, but he hadn't shown it yet in the stats. Now he's showing it in the stats. He's gaining on approach every event. He's got the distance here. He's going to gain off the tee. He doesn't even need to drive it amazing. He just needs to kind of just be fine off the tee. He's going to gain there. The short game looks a lot better. And if we're looking for guys who should outperform on Bermuda, I think we can go back and look at how he played at the RSM and say, this guy can fuck on these types of greens. He's he's spiked multiple times now, putting on these Bermuda surfaces, clearly comfortable. My only question with him would be, 
that another thing, like I wrote, talked about this in the write-up that's consistent amongst guys who have played well or have won here is they'd played good in difficult conditions before. Like they'd shown the ability to finish top five in a tournament with single digit uh, scoring and things like that. We've yet to see Ludwig really play in a truly difficult event. Farmers is there, but this but is we different. don't have many of them. Though. That's the thing. Like, right. I'm not like, going to fault him for that, but I agree with you for like, we haven't seen it, but like he hasn't really had the chance to prove it. I agree. You know what I'm saying yeah. so. If, yeah. For me, that's he's going to be my my pick there. But that's the question that like I have about his game. Then I'll go Vic. At the end of the day, these next three guys, I don't like any of them. Like I am yeah. out on all three of these guys. Vic, when he's played well here the last couple of years, it's been all ball striking, and his ball striking is not very good right now. So like right. that concerns me a little bit. Is that when he's? It's not like he magically puts great here or chips great here. He's fine. He's like average at both those things here. It's been his ball striking. And he's going to drive it well. He's continued to drive it well, even during this kind of down streak. But uh, Vic's a no for me. Statistically, Xander would be my favorite of these four guys, but I'm absolutely not getting involved uh, there. And then Cantlay, he spiked for a huge putting week at Riv. His driving is still awful. He's ne- he's negative accuracy in five straight events. Like the driving is still bad for him. That's ended up costing yeah. him in the final round there. So I'm a fade this week on Pat. Uh, he played good here last year, but that was solely because of his driving. He didn't putt well. This is Bermuda like the patch tr- and now his odds have moved from he was 20 at genesis which was good odds now he's back down to like 14 16 to 1 it doesn't make sense can we be mad if victor or pat win like can like i mean i don't know i i was mad on the weekend over patrick can because you know how much i bet him yeah but then i really like then he obviously didn't win and i'm like all right this guy i if i'm not betting him if he wins i lost like if i lose to a patrick Cantley who i bet every single time and after all the heartbreak it's like whatever you got beat I don't know if we can be mad if Victor or I mean if Pat or X beats us. Truthfully, I don't think we can really be mad if any of these guys uh, beat us because I mean maybe Vic just because he has the dog in him, like you said, he's capable of yeah. winning, like he has the the ability. What are odds? Like fourteen? That and that's the problem. Yeah, his exactly, best yeah. odds right now. You can get a sixteen on like Bet Online, so not even like a, a legal book, you know. And sixteen's fine, right. but. Yeah, I think it's the it's the pit of despair part of the board for a reason. None of them are going to be for me. Now I can always change my mind, and, and Ludwig is interesting to me, but we'll see what happens there. And then we get into this next range of guys, another range of just kind of a clown show, guys who probably aren't going to win the tournament, <laughs> but you could talk yourself into all of them. Sam Burns, uh, obviously playing well zero track record of playing good in difficult conditions you know i'm a sam burns guy again i'll tell people when sam burns is going to win and again i haven't crossed him off entirely this week but like burns on a difficult course yeah it's bermuda but like he's not a diffy c's guy tommy fleetwood is a diffy c's guy we know 30 to 1 you've previously said the worst bet ever on tommy fleetwood i don't think you'd say would you say that again this week at a place that he's played for tom yeah. No, no. Uh, what was the week that I said worst bet ever for Tommy Fleetwood? Was that uh, uh, Jenny? Yes. I, yeah. Okay. T- that was the worst bet ever. Yeah. Uh, no, this week he's fine. Like, I'm sure he'll grind out a, a T9, something never mixed, which is st- like kind of like Alex Noren last week. I think I nailed Alex Noren that last week. He was just going to make pars, grind, grind, grind. And, like he, and I think he finished like T20 or T15. Uh, at the Honda, but yeah, I don't have any real feelings about Tommy Fleetwood heading into this week. Does have some high end finishes here, but I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna sit here and tout Tommy Fleetwood to win the golf tournament. If it will, if it will, ha- if it will be a good result, result, I believe it will be backdoor. Yeah, so Burns and Fleetwood, both guys in that category. Again, I don't think we can be mad if if they win. Here's let's talk about who might make us mad if we didn't bet them. Not that we've totally decided who we're gonna be. But we may bet these guys. But I'm going to tell you a guy, and if you don't bet him any wins, should we feel stupid or should we not? Uh, the first one is a guy who we both bet here last year. His odds have been cut in half since that event. That's Jordan Spieth. Uh, yeah. He's playing great. He's playing great golf. He uh, He's gaining off the tee. He's gaining his around the green's been amazing. And what I like the most about Spieth is that his Bermuda results uh, have been fantastic. It was T6 at FedEx, 6 at the Hero, 3rd at Century, uh, T6 back on the Bermuda largely conditions in phoenix didn't play good at pebble got dq'd at jenny but he was playing fine at jenny like he could have mixed at jenny if he doesn't forget what he scored uh t4 here both starts in a row but he's now 20 to 20 to 1 ish would you be upset if he wins yeah i maybe actually a little bit because he i did say he's going to win in florida i do love him these next three weeks so uh 
maybe a little bit. I don't know if we can go back to him at this number, T4, T4. And we were both on him last year because he was a great number and he like didn't have the course history. Like he was just a, a decent course fit, but didn't have the crazy course history year in, year out. It was just a one start a few years ago. So that's what we, that's what drew us to him last year. So I, I think he's going to be popular, which is scary. If I don't think we do. If Spieth, and we do, I think this is again a good, you got to think about your bets in this manner. If Spieth has a one shot lead going into the final round, do you think he'd close it out? No, because he was 10 under last year and won the golf tournament on 13, I think, and lost. And yeah, he like, finished like, like, T5 or something. All he had to do is play even coming in, and then all of a sudden he couldn't hit the fairways. He missed a couple of short putts. I don't trust Jordan to win. Like, he, he his his only win in years was at RBC and Valero. And before that, he went multiple years without winning. Like, I don't know how you can trust him at 20 to one. So I, I'm going to say, the, I, yeah, I was going to say, and, and he, he had the lead over the weekend on 18 at, at Bay Hill. And he hit that duck hook, like, Mm-hmm. 150 yard drive that almost went over the fence or it might've went over the fence and had to t- make, it made like a, a double and he ha- had a bigger lead. I don't know if you remember that it was either Friday. I think it was Friday uh, afternoon. Mm-hmm. So yeah. And that's the only time the other time he had the lead and he didn't really pan out. So I do agree with the not trusting thing. So I'm officially going to say, I will not be like angry if Jordan wins at 22 to one or whatever it is. Like I'm not going to be angry. Colin, He's uh, you can get twenty eight to one on Colin. I bet him here last year. The wind blew last mm-hmm. year, which fucked me on uh, Colin. Colin, uh, let you kick off Colin. What like what do we even say about this guy? I am gonna piggyback off what you said about Colin, uh, or what you said about the course. If it becomes softer fairways and guys are hitting fairways, then it just becomes an a uh, an an approach fest, and you gotta just hit your irons close. Twenty eight to one, hell yeah, sign me up. He hasn't been playing great in 2024 because he kicked off 20 he ended 2023 really hot um but yeah his number's starting to drift and he kind of wins when his number drifts like not at least in, in the first few, few years of his career uh so i can be talked into the 28 especially if we get in a that weather like we're thinking which we'll see later in the week so that that'd be my call and take yeah, I, I think the number is totally fair. And he's the type we saw him play good uh, opening round at the players last year. Like he's won at concession. These like he can play good in these conditions. Mm-hmm. My concern with him is he's lost strokes on these greens in all three starts. Uh, he putted okay on the West Coast. He's putting better in general. The short game has definitely improved, but uh, that would concern me a little bit with Colin. Would I be upset if he won at 28 to 1? I don't think so. I think I can live with myself uh, there. Obviously, can live with myself if Cam Young wins at 33 to 1. Hmm. Uh, I'm not even going to talk about that. If he wins at 33 to 1, that's fine. Max is 28 to 1. Max might suck okay. golf all okay. of a sudden. He, he, we love Max a He's lot. He's going to win now that we said that. But like, his, his something is wrong. We've, we've come in here and said something is wrong every week and he finished T16 at Riv. And if he can't even play good at Riv, I mean, T16 is a fine result, but like Max, you expect to be in the mix at Riv and then he sucked in the match. Something if wrong. you look at the numbers and the just paper results for Max, they don't look like horrendous, but I test wise, just knowing ball, he looks off. He truthfully looks off. He's, he got two weeks off now. Hopefully he's fixed something, but I can't trust him at this number. Truthfully, you can't assess a player from the match or you shouldn't, but I'm going to, because if I didn't see the match, I would actually sit here and tell you that like his numbers started to look better at Genesis. And then I would go down and look at his, he's been good here. All four starts and his ball striking here is like sick every single year. He yeah. clearly is comfortable with like the, the ball striking conditions, but he was off the planet at the match. Like, like yeah. it, and that course is wide open and he was like almost every hole. He was like in the wood, like woods or wherever, like hacking his ball out. Uh, I actually, I might be upset if he wins at 28 to one. I don't know. Yeah. He, he I you're next guy. So yeah. But that's, that's yes. You have the bias there. Uh, your guy though. This, his number is tough. Now, Willie Z. We talked, we've talked about him multiple times at, at Bay Hill. You said you've had him. He's right there over your shoulder. I can see him from here. He cut he's 30 to one, uh, on Willie Z obviously playing good golf there at the Jenny. He's gained in every category in three straight starts. Like all signs are good. 
he yeah, he's ball striked it well here. This is a course where his style of play would would make sense. He hasn't putted well here before or been good around the greens. That'd be a concern for me. But are you eyeing him up at 30 to one? Uh, I week? have to be. Yeah, I mean, firm and fast greens, long irons. I know his long irons aren't great, but uh, uh, long driver. He plays putts usually well on this style of course, but he has not in his career. I just think the course sets up really well for him. But if he is the most popular golfer, I just have to be out. And I'm kind of nervous for that. I'm nervous. I'm also nervous that he finishes runner up and then just wins the next start. That's probably not going to happen. Uh, so uh, I'm really in a bubble and I have mixed feelings about Willie Z. I love him. I really think it's a great course fit for him. We'll have some uh, Willie Z leeway this week. I'm not really sure when, where I'm going to run him out, but I've been talking about Willie Z at Bay Hill for years now. So or for months now. So there's, there's going to be something for sure. And this is where the the bias comes in. And like I just said, I might be upset if Max wins, but that's because I love Max and I want to be on oh, all yeah. of his wins. Like for be. me, if Willie Z wins at 30, I don't care. Like that's fine. Like that's I'm good. But you with your bias, with yeah. your love of Sal, like you'd be upset about it. So I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up on your card this week. Uh, the next few guys here, we can do a hypothetical three ball here about with three guys who I think are all interesting this week. I think the number is fair on all of them. Matt Fitzpatrick, uh, 33 to one. He's played great here forever. Uh, I like what he did last week at Cogs and he finished T21, but he seemed like he was getting better as the week went on. It's his driving that's kind of been hit or miss this year, uh, which is usually a strength of his game, but he always drives it well here. He's got the distance. I feel very confident that he's going to gain off of the T this week. I like him back on Bermuda uh, surfaces, both on and around the green. So Matt Fitz, Justin Thomas, who, all of a sudden it's 30 to one again. JT has drifted back to 30 to one. He had one bad mm-hmm. week and all of a sudden he, he's yeah. nobody wants him anymore. And then Jason day, he's at 40 to one. So, you know, the odds on a three ball here would be a little off, but let's just say it's the same for, for shits and giggles here day back to back top tens out West T six at pebble ninth at the Jenny T 10 at century. Uh, he's won here before Jason day is playing great golf. He's never a guy who pops in the models. The stats never are good for J day, but he plays good golf. He's just a good golfer. So of those three fits JT, uh, J day, give me not, not just hypothetical three ball. Give me least likely to most likely, uh, to win this event. I will go, uh, most likely Justin Thomas, Second, Fitz, and three, Jason Day. Uh, Justin Thomas, I just believe, I loved him going into Genesis. Obviously, the one time I bet him this year, he misses the cup. But I'm not going to fault him for one bad week. And I'm not going to fault him for bad course history. He just doesn't have any course history, similar to Spieth last year. So I like Justin Thomas in that aspect. He definitely could win on a golf course like this. Matt Fitzpatrick, the ball striking, the driver has been up and down more more down of late but i like him in 2024 to have another big win and then jason day a a non-competitive top 10 finish is what i can see i just don't see him winning in a golf course like this and a field like this whereas fitzpatrick and thomas have uh more win equity i'd say and that's i like he's not I, i don't think he's high in the model this week fits but like i just i've gotten to the point with fits where he's gonna win probably once a season like he's proven that he's got the ability to do that he wins big events he wins tough golf course events and we've just now listed off probably 12 15 guys like higher than him on the odds board where i can find faults in every single one of them yeah fitz has some faults in his game but he's 33 to one he's got amazing course history here we know that he can win he just played last week got some reps in played fine finished in the exact same position that i think rory did like i like fitz this week uh, he's not a guy that I bet a lot, but I'm definitely going to be uh, eyeing up Matty Fitz. Yeah, I wrote if I'd be in at 40. And if 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 that would, uh, uh, I don't know if it's still there anymore, but I think I'd be in at 40. Oh, yeah. If he drifts to 40, sign me up. He's at 33 right now, but he could drift, and then he'd be one of those guys who's drifting, which is what we're on the hunt for. So Matty Fitz, one to watch. Minwoo, uh, flowchart. This is not a Lynx course last time I checked, so that's going to be a no for me. Hideki and Keegan. Uh, you wrote up Keegan, I saw, and that actually led me to look a little bit closer at Keegan. Keegan's been playing some fine golf. He uh, He's gained in every tee to green category and every start back to the Sony, and he also hit the ball really well at Century. His putter's kind of been ebbing and flowing, but he comes to a course where he has three straight top 11 finishes. Uh, he tends to putt better on Bermuda. Like I'd prefer Keegan on Bermuda versus out on the POA out west. Uh, obviously, Hideki just won. So hypothetical three ball here. Hideki, Keegan, Jake Knapp. I mean, how could you not say Jake Knapp? <laughs> I, mean, I, I should be hypothetical two ball Pavone and Knapp, just the two best, best players on tour. 
Um, I'd probably have to go with, uh, I mean, this course does make sense for old Jake Knapp. Uh, probably Keegs. I just love how consistent he's played, and he's a guy who wants it. He's never a guy who's, like, going to garner reps or just take sh- take a day off. That dude is grinding all the time and will just will himself to a top finish if his game is there. Playing good golf, great course history. I, I, I'd go Keegan there. 11 straight made cuts in this event for Keegan. Obviously, no cut this week, but, like, his, and he's gained T to green almost every single, like in every category, almost every single start. Like he's going to gain T to green. Just becomes a question if he can spike with the putter. He just spiked for 4.4 uh, at Sony. He even spiked for three at Pebble. Like he's playing good golf. Uh, he is 66 to one. You can get on Keegan Bradley. You know, he can win uh, if he gets into the mix. He's obviously still, still got on that chip on his shoulder from the, uh, Ryder Cup. So yeah, why not Keegan? Uh, I could be down. Jake Knapp though. I'm excited to watch him play. And obviously on paper, it makes a lot of sense. He's top 10 in the model again this week, as he should. I will say again, number one in the model this week, Pavone. And I want to talk about Pavone because you may say, how is he number one in the model again? He played good last week. Like I had Pavone. He popped up right into the mix on Saturday. He was right there. He got fucked on 16 on, uh, he, he fucked himself, but then he also got fucked because I was watching. He was right in the mix. He he was going to go into the final round like a shot or two back again. Every single event, Pavone is up there. He hit it long on 16. It hit the grandstand. Then it hit the rake and bounced into the water. He made double bogey. That cost him. Uh, but that was a pretty terrible break or else he would have been right there in the mix going to Sunday. He's playing good every single event. His approach play is amazing. He's a good putter. He struggled a little bit around the greens and with the driver last week, but he's got the distance. I think he'll be fine off the tee. I actually like the course fit better for him here than at Honda. He's clearly good in difficult conditions. Uh, what are the odds on Pavone this week? You can get him at 90 to 1. I'm probably betting Pavone again. Dude, that's funny because like these are things that happen like on a yearly basis. And like we're like, how do we miss Pavone at 90? Like I could just see myself saying that at like just a generational year. And you go back and look at the odds and like he was 90 to one after two straight wins. So yeah, or whatever a win in great form. I I I probably won't bet him, but I just can see that happening. I mean, when we talk when we talk about would we be angry, I'd be so much more angry of Pavone winning at 90 to 1 than almost any of the players that we've talked to. Yeah. I so agree far, with that. like at the I end of the day, that. like I'd be, I'd be, and I think so rapid fire. Now, again, would you be mad if these guys win at the odds that I tell you that these players are Teagues 60 to one Teagues has played well here before you were up Teagues. I know you're high on Teagues. Yeah, mad. this is definitely a, uh, the Gala golf course. In my opinion, can drive it long, can drive it with a little penalty, I guess. Uh, I mean, there's definitely some penalty, but less penalty than other courses and just tap into that creative short game and, is that that's the gala so um he's played all right i think he, it's a great number for on him and I, it's, more, it's more number with me on the gala than anything else so i love that 60 to one and i like him in these conditions second at century fifth at uh waste he tends to never play good two starts in a row he finished fifth at waste and then t37 at jenny uh he tends to kind of go every other so if we're going every other then we got to like him he's t14 here uh he should gain off the t should gain across the board so i do like teaks uh Sungjae sucks. We didn't even talk about Sungjae. Nikolai 80 to 1. Nikolai 80 to 1. Did not realize that was his number. Wow, yeah. Just talent, man. Like I like the first time he was out here, I said, talent alone, you bet this guy almost won farmers that first week. So yeah, yeah. 80 to 1. Yeah. And uh, I wrote and this is true that up until Kurt, you had to have good course history here to win. It'd been like back to 2000, like every guy had good course history. Kurt just showed up uh, and fit the course really well and had played good in these types of conditions before and won. I, I, I'll i be upset if Nikolai went to 80 to 1. He's under consideration. Uh, we're not going to be upset if Bez won. Most tips last week didn't even come close to winning. For a second there, he came close to winning. Ejected, missed the cut after being like T2 for a second. Classic Bez. Uh, Siwoo, 90 to 1. Can Siwoo win this event? Uh, no, I'm not really seeing this as a Siwoo golf course. He's, uh, played it a few times mixed bag, but I'm not, I'm not really sure. I don't think Siwoo could win. And then a guy you wrote him up. He he's, uh, you're saying he's the Luke list of this week. Emiliano Grillo. Uh, he absolutely lit this place up ball striking last year. He's a uh, mercurial, but I like him in these scoring conditions. 125 yeah. to one on that. I mean, when Grillo. you think of Grillo, just a ball striker and bad putter, you don't really got to make a ton of birdies. It makes sense, and I see why he's played well here when you think about it. And, yeah, he gained over 10 strokes ball striking last year and, like, lost that all on the putting surfaces. That's exactly what Luke List did at Riviera last year, and he almost won this year. So I just think based on that alone, like, how could you not give him a shot? I was high on Grio coming into 2024, 
And uh, I, this is a golf course that fits his, fits him. So yeah, yeah. You can only bet one of these guys at, a, at a roughly 100 to 1. But it's not 100 to 110 to 1 on these uh, guys. Only bet one of them. EVR, Dick Fowler, Cam Davis, Jaeger. I have to go with Cam Davis. I have to go with Cam Davis because the stats don't look good, but he makes sense on a golf course like this. He's long. He, I still, I'm just, I'm bottling up that Cam Davis win in a big field. I really think it could happen. And he played, I don't remember the exact numbers, but did you see my Cam Davis write up? He played the front nine at, at Riviera, like nine under par and the, very, very frustrating for Cam Davis because I had him in at Riviera and he finished like T forty after like leading the golf tournament. Uh, I'll go with I'll go with Davis probably. Yeah, I don't think he's you? gonna win. I don't think he's gonna win, but I like a Stevie Yeggs bounce back spot. Like Yeggs just, yeah. I was on him at Mexico. I didn't think he made a lot of sense last week because of the he actually drove it amazing. He just putted terrible last week. Uh, he's T fifty two in his only start here. We've talked about this is a guy that we like in the single digit lower scoring conditions. We saw it at Tory. Uh, I like Stevie Eggs for a bounce back here, but I don't think he can win. If I had to only bet one, what, what were Ricky's stats last week? Because Ricky kind of bounced back last week. He, uh, they're not great. He putted good. He drove it a lot better. He's played okay here before. It was That's that one round that was like a really good putting round, and he gave some back. He was like 600 through 11 and gave some back. I think that was Saturday. But was yeah, Saturday. in the would I be upset if Ricky wanted 100 to 1? Yeah, I would be upset about that because he is not a 101 golfer when he's playing his best. And he started to look a little bit better last few weeks. Uh, now we're deep down the board. We're into the hundred plus range. Is there anybody you've been eyeing a guy who I, again, th- these two guys, do they have any real chance to win? Probably not, but I don't think they're terrible bets. Taylor Moore has been sneaky playing some nice golf. He's losing off the tee but that's because of his accuracy. Like he can bomb it from the tee here and, and gain with some distance. He put up almost eight strokes approach at Jenny after putting up almost four strokes at uh, uh, Phoenix. He's made one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 cuts in a row. And we know he's better on Bermuda. That's his game. He has two made cuts here where he putted really well. Taylor Moore and in, in these scoring conditions, he's 225 to one uh, Taylor Moore can win on the PGA tour. And I, he's got, the ball striking numbers are impressive. Best of his career. Yeah. I mean, we are in Florida, you know, that uh, go for Taylor Moore. Uh, no real long shots besides Grio. I think I want to just cap it at that, especially in this more condensed field, but I do want to ask you about and go back up the board a little bit. Wyndham Clark golf course, I think makes sense for him. The course history is really bad, but he was a much different golfer back then than he is the last year. So you're a Wyndham guy, you know him better than a lot of people. Uh, thoughts on Wyndham? Very, I think he'd be sneaky. Yeah, let me get a look at Wendy here. Can so that's what I like to do. We kind of go through the categories. Can he gain off of the tee? You would think yes because of his distance, but he's always had distance and he's lost a shit ton in three starts here off of the tee. So uh, that that concerns me. It's like we talked about Pendy a few weeks ago. Like when a guy should be gaining off the tee and he's not multiple times. To me, why, that's a sign yeah. that he like something bad. He doesn't like the something about the the tee shots. So if, and if he can't gain off the tee, then it's going to be a no for me. Like, yeah, I think I'm out. I think I'm out on Wendy, but, but again, if Wyndham won at 60 to one, uh, 55 to one, I'd probably be pretty upset. Uh, Harris English, he's 55 to one. Those are terrible odds on Harris. Uh, even though Harris, uh, Uh, Russ Henley, can we get, he's 70 to one. Uh, you were on him last week. What's the lay of the land on your boy, Russ? Yeah. Russ Henley was, basically sevy on the putting surfaces last week he gained seven strokes putting last week and he just did everything else average which is very very disappointing it was like the opposite of russ henley uh yeah i followed him for a while just never really looked great with the iron shots looked uncomfortable made a few bad chips uh he actually made a lot of bad chips i was following him for a while and he put like very straightforward chips to like 12 feet and uh, made not enough of them. So uh, yeah, uh, Russ on a golf course like this, mm, I'm not sure. Uh, who's the other guy? Oh, I was going to give you a chance to Vic lap uh, your Eric Coltex last week, and then also give me an update on on what how you're thinking about him this week. Oh uh, yeah, he had no chance last week. He's got less of a chance this week. Okay. 
Uh, and then this is, would you be mad if Brian Harmon won the tournament at 150 to one? Like, no, I would not be mad, but he's not playing good golf at all in 2024. His stats are really bad, really bad. But Bermuda, he's never played good here. Uh, he actually, he does have a couple of top 20s. I like him in more difficult conditions. I think Harmon, I don't think he's going to win, but I think we see Harmon's name on the leaderboard at some point and everybody goes to themselves like, why did we let not bet Harmon at 150 to one? And then he probably falls off at the end. But I think people are going to be uh, kicking themselves at some point during the tournament about Brian Harmon. Uh, yeah, that pretty much covers a good chunk of field. So uh, I know you haven't set up the card. You're considering going top of the board. You're considering not going top of the board. If you were putting together a card right this second, what would it be? Um, I got with that before seeing the chart. I gotta say, Will, Will, Will Z got to be on the card. I I can get behind the uh the JT Will JT Colin thing. Just low key, just middle 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 of the odds, and then Grio. Those four. That's definitely well under seven X. And then I would say those four for now. Will Z JT uh, Colin and uh, Emiliano Grio. Early early considerations. I like that. My initial last night, I put together three names that just popped into my, or I did some research and three names that came up for me were Ludwig, Spieth, and Day. I think the Spieth number, I can't, I can't do Spieth at that number. Like I was a Spieth whisperer last year. Every time he was in the mix, I was on yeah, him, yeah. but he was never below 25 to one in any of those. He was like 25 to one or 40 to one. So I hate Spieth's number. Uh, Ludwig, I need to think also about Thigala for me. Antiques. I do like Teagues. Uh, Ludwig will play terrible if I bet him. He'll play great if I don't. So I've, I've got to figure out how I'm going to assess that situation. But I'm leaning towards, like, if I started my card at 33 to 1 with Matt Fitzpatrick, I, I'd think that'd be fine. Like, or JT. Like, I don't. It's as things you cannot currently, bet JT. As things currently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as things currently. I Well, I never. He was fine with him, but I really hated him after he talked shit about UW last year. In the before the playoff, he tweeted something like, "How is UW like in the top four? And then, of course, uh, Alabama lost in the semifinal, so sucks to suck for JT. Uh, also, quick aside: the UW players at the combine absolutely popping off, and everybody's like, "Oh my god!" Like Michael Penix, he's so good at throwing the football. Yeah, no shit. Like <laughs> people, people all of last year were like, "Oh, UW sucks!" Like how are they under? How have they won twenty games in a row? It's because our players were really, really good football good players. Guys. Like, yeah. And now all of a sudden, like they're all crushing the combine and everybody's like, oh my God, Romo Dunes, this guy's amazing. But yeah, obviously, how do you think this team made the final? So apologies. I had to say that because I was getting really pissed off this week when everybody was tweeting those things out. Uh, but yeah, I, like I'm, I'm, I, I just can't get excited about anybody sub 30 to one. And I'm not buying the narrative that this is the week that things change at the top of the board. Like, I really don't think that it is. I don't see any reason why guys are more likely to win this week than they were at Genesis or Pebble. Like there, you still need to putt. Well, you still need to have guts. Kirk Kitty Yama just wanted 150 to one, 200 to one last year. Like, I don't think this is any slam dunk uh, that that will be changing this week. So I think I'll go down the board at uh, API, but quickly, let's quickly touch on the other events this week. Puerto Rico open a special event because the players in it usually absolutely suck. Uh, I don't think there's any handicap that you can really do for Puerto Rico. Like any player could win Puerto Rico. We've seen all sorts of different types of players win. I prefer guys with distance and some Bermuda. Like, do you have a a style of player that you're looking for in Puerto Rico or any names that come to mind? Mainly just birdie makers. It's more like just very birdie makers, guys that aren't afraid to go low and have some coastal history. Um, a guy who doesn't have coastal history, but I am not, I think can go low in an event like this. Uh, Rio. I like Rio. Uh, Rio. Uh, uh, Rio. We always fuck this up because I thought you were saying Grio again. And we did this last week and you thought I was saying Grio. Rio. He's not is, is who you're talking about here. Correct. Yeah. Thoughts on Rio. Like he can, he can fuck here. I, I think I prefer Rio in a little bit more difficult scoring conditions. Like I think he's going to, okay. he's going to play good, but I think I'd like him at minus 12 minus 13. Uh, I, I mean, I haven't looked at this field, obviously Jimmy Stanger, our guy, Jimmy, if you have not familiarized yourself with the game of Jimmy Stanger, uh, do yourself a favor, get over to data golf, take a look at his off the tee numbers uh, this year. Jimmy Stangs could mix it. I would also say like, you could just go look at Mexico. Any of those guys who played good at Mexico, why couldn't they just play good here as well? I think Ben Griffin is probably winning now. Ooh, Uh, my friends, uh, Steven, Mike will be excited here. He said burger. Burger's playing. I had no idea that Burger's down there. What's the, let's deal with him. Yeah, I he was cooking on a Thursday and into into early Friday. Led the field uh, tee to green. I think after the first. Yeah, game. 
Yeah, uh, I'm not really too high on Berger's game for 72 holes to win a golf tournament. He's here to get FedEx Cup points. Obviously, he's here to win, but I don't I don't see it. Um, Chris got her up. He Your finished boy. seventh here two years ago and is playing all right golf. He made the cut in uh, Palm Beach and looked okay. Honestly, way better than I thought he would. And who else do I think could play well here? Oddly enough, he he's been he's been a, a popular first round leader pick, a popular guy in the industry. Don't like him, but he's got great course history. It's three straight top tens: Slash and Dash, Nate Lashley. Ooh, Nate Your Lashley. Guy. You gotta like Nate, uh, a guy who I've had my eyes on. I've, I haven't bet him yet, but he's starting to play better. And he he used to, except for last year when he forgot how to putt, and he was terrible. He was a guy who would mix every season. Troy Merritt. He's ninety to one in this field. He's playing a lot better at golf. Troy mixes like when Troy's playing his yeah. game, he mixes. So he played good at Rocket. Nate Lashley connection there. Uh, Aaron Wise is back. Aaron, he's sixty six to one. He cannot win. He, he should be 500 to one. Like, oh, okay, like, okay. I like, thought you were going to say that number was too no, long. I was saying, no, I'm saying, like, he, when was the last time he golfed? <laughs> yeah. He, no, yeah. 66 to one? No way. <laughs> that's well, it. Yeah, that's his, terrific. He literally, his, his approach numbers, I could, I might have better approach numbers than him before he, like, disappeared from golf. That's insane. That what, is did Justin abs- Saza? what are Justin Saza's odds? Sa is uh, 40 to one. Uh, that's, that's tough. He's, something's wrong with Sa. But he could show up and play good. And if he doesn't have to chip, that would be to his advantage. Uh, David Skins coming off that strong performance. Keep your eyes on it, David. Uh, I think we've got to consider the DP guys because the DP guys have been crushing in these events. Who who are the DP guys? Obviously, Rasmus. Rasmus. He's a uh, favorite? Yeah, yeah not a course for him, though. No, 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 no. And he can't. He's a loser. So 18 to 1, no for me on Rasmus. Your boy, Vic Perez. He played good last week. I was on him the week before. <laughs> he played good last week. You liked him. He's 50 to 1. Uh, Vic Perez could play good. Uh, who else do we got here from the DP? Oh, he's not from the DP, but Higo. Higo played good last week. He's uh, 50 to 1. We talked him up uh, in Mexico. It didn't quite work out, but I think we know that Higo's on the cusp of doing something good. Mike Kim finished T5 here last year and T16 the year before, but he is off right now, and I don't want to bet a Mike. Well, he's probably 35 to 1. Mike Kim sucks at golf, but he uh, is 35 to 1. No. If Mike Kim wins, uh, 35 to 1 to be it. Uh, Jorge can't beat. <laughs> Jorge Campillo's come over from the DP. Watch out for Jorge. He, uh, what did he do in his debut a couple weeks ago? He, uh, T9, he was T19 in Mexico, T53 at Cognizant. Uh, never mind. I'm good on Jorge. Uh, Paul Barjon, your guy Paul's playing. Uh, why not Vajagas at 100 to 1? Could Vajagas mix again? He made the cut. So in Palm Beach, maybe. He oh, said he's got it. So he's got a newfound confidence in his game. I would hope so. He was playing great in the fall. Uh, I'll give you one more guy to talk about because you sent a text last week and you said this guy's a generational driver of the golf ball. He's a generational ball striker. You took a video of him right before he hits the ball, his hand position. I know you're a big fan of that. A D D C he's 150 to one. Uh, He's been terrible so far. This terrible. He has missed back-to-back cuts. He does not look like he knows how to chip or putt. Uh, could he bounce back here at 150 to one? I just love that he's already won twice on the corn, and he. I was breathtaking from him swinging in the golf club. So, yeah, that's what I'll have to say about him. Uh, Michael Glitchick is in the field, a, a guy that I always like to have my the eyes Canadian. on. <laughs> the Canadian, Birdie Maker. Uh, the bottom of this field is absolutely terrible. Uh, I'm probably going to sling like eight guys in the 50 to 100 to one range and just kind of see what happens. Jimmy Stanger definitely under strong consideration. Uh, and then some of these, these some of these corn fairy guys have been good. Bridgman, uh, he Jacob Bridgman's good. Did you see Bridgman yeah. at all in person? He, yeah, he, looked, he, looked, he, looked, he, looked he nice. was playing with, uh, I forget who he was playing with on the, uh, the first two days. I think it was, it might have been Novak. I don't remember, but I was following him for a while. Uh, can hit the ball. BSB. SH Kim 50 to one. First round leader. I like SH. He, his, his approach numbers make, he like, he can't hit his irons, but I don't know. Like, so we'll see last year, uh, Nicholas Echeverry won this event. I think right at like infinity to one, uh, Carson Young had the lead for a while and, and choked it away. Shout out to our boy BK. Right. Uh, so any style of play works here. Make birdies, be good on Bermuda, have some guts. Honestly, I don't even know if you need guts to win this event. Uh, Nicholas, such Echever- Wait a second. Nicholas Echeverry is 70 to 1 to defend. He's been playing good. 
Yeah, he's had his sneaky. He played in the in a, both Hawaii events. I think he had a sneaky. All right, like he was t twenty five at Century, t twenty four at Mexico. He was mixing t last week. T twenty one last week. I'm I'm gonna have to consider defend back to back. Nicholas Hatchaberry at seventy to one. He's playing good. <laughs> like yeah. uh, like so. All right, Nicholas, take a look. And then uh, we got Live. We know nothing about the course. Have you looked at the course at all? Do you know anything about? I have it? not yet. I have not. Hold on. Let me, Only one let me, person knows about the course, and we know who that is. <laughs> yeah, you got to listen to the broadcast. What is the course called? Shang. Oh, Hong Kong Golf Club in Shang Shui. Hold on. I'm, I'm very quickly going to get an aerial overhead look and tell you what the course looks like, and then you tell me who can win based on oh, what the the visual of this course looks like. Uh, okay. It's right next to it's right next to the water, so we've got an ocean view of Deep Water Bay in Hong Kong. Uh, what in the world is? I don't even know if this is. There's only three holes. Maybe it was like, under... like <laughs> are they just like that's... are they just gonna play the uh, same course uh, or the same three holes over and over again on? Uh... Sounds like Peter's then, if that's the case. <laughs> uh, here we go. I, I found the real course, not next to the water. That was uh, fake news. Apologies. Uh, there is a Hong Kong golf course next to the beer. All right, it looks like we've got tree lines. Uh, looks kind of tough driving. The greens look really easy. I think we've got ourselves a. Drive it well, and then it, it's got some Tulsa vibes. I think we can look to Tulsa as a potential comp here. Bryson feels due to me. Like, he's playing good. Uh, I don't know what his odds are this week, but before doing any research, hold on, let me give you the odds, too. Uh, the odds are Rom so, 550. So Mito sucks. Mito, I'm good on Mito. Like, Rom's 550, Neiman 750, Hatton 14, Gooch 14, Bryson Hatton's 14. DJ 16, Brooks 16, Louis 18 now somehow. Cam Smith is 20. Uh, what? Yeah. yeah. That's insane. Cam Smith has been playing bad, though. I can't lie. But still, that's crazy. That he's 16. I would What's say Brendan like... Steel? <laughs> that's the question that everybody's been asking themselves. 100 to 1 on <laughs> Brendan Steele, if you want him. 100 to 1 on Steele. Uh, but yeah, I think my early lean... Oh, also, I think Lahiri. Anytime we get to Asia... You got to have your eyes on uh, Anurban, especially if it rains. Then we got to keep our eyes on the Harry. But uh, my early lean, TBD, TBD on who I'm going to bet it live, but uh, Bryson, 14 to 1. Last week I said Neiman right. was my lean, and I didn't bet him. So I probably need to stick by my guns here on Bryson. Amen. Oh, Amen. Oh, all right. Well, uh, we'll have write-ups for all these tournaments. We'll have models up for all of these tournaments uh, soon enough over there on Vincerics.com. Get to golf.vincerics.com for the odds. Like and subscribe to the pod. And then also, uh, we've got the Vincerics underscore golf Twitter going. We're going to be posting stuff there uh, all the time. I've been getting into Canva. My design skills right now are popping off. So we'll have some cool visuals, things like that. Follow us there. We really appreciate everybody who supports the pod and to listening who listens to the pod. So good luck out there this week at all the events. As I said, the rare chance to hit a quadruple winner. You don't get this opportunity once very often. If you hit all four, just retire from golf betting. Uh, call it good. Jerry's appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Always. Thank you.